our speaker this morning, of course, is very special in my heart, and I believe in all y'all's heart. Amen. Uh, he's an author, he's a teacher, he's been a pastor, and he is a confident speaker. He is an educator and a good one. I can attest to that. He is now in the process of authoring a new Bible entitled The New Millennium Bible. Mm -hmm. But let me tell you something. <clears throat> It is written for the common man. I don't know if he knows that, but I've been reading it, and it's to me it's written to the common man, to the simple man that doesn't understand theological terms. He doesn't know that, but he's opening the door where people are not very well educated to receive an awesome understanding of the Word of God. Yeah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. You ever read the King James Version? When you first got saved, those these and thou's, and I don't know what to do with them. <laughs> so you were looking everywhere, a different Bible to just kind of explain what, what uh, King James was saying there. But uh, we got a Bible now that I believe is going to be a blessing beyond our brother's imagination. Uh, now I forgot where I was at. <laughs> he is the executive president of. He is our beloved, fearful leader. Hallelujah. I say fearful leader. Uh, you know, we were in Mexico, and uh, he was always standing behind me. And I said, brother, he says, no, brother, I stand out like a sore thumb. <laughs> Do you remember? <laughs> I said, behind me, I feel safe. <laughs> I said, but you, you are a fearful leader. I feel safe behind you. <laughs> Praise God. It's a blessing. Our beloved and faithful leader, Dr. Henry Hartman. Come on up here. Well, thank you for the nice comments. Uh, I don't let things like that go to my head. Uh, some people do. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of times when I was younger, I let things go to my head. I thought I was a big shot. But after pastoring two churches, I can relate to what he said, you know. Uh, I've suffered a lot from sheep bite. Talked about the marks of Christ in the body. Well, I got the marks of the sheep bite, but I can just tell you this. I can't really show you. It's too personal. But I'll just give you a hint. I was running as fast as I could when they bit me. You got, you got the idea? I mean, I can't show you where they bit me, but sheep bite. I think those sheep, you know, they want to bite the shepherd sometimes when you try to talk to them. So I have the marks of Christ in my body. And I got a feeling that's what happened to Paul. Uh, he never said he was a pastor, but I always tell people, I want to be like Paul. I'm not a pastor anymore, but I'm a pastor. <laughs> what in the world is that? Pastor, we know, when he was before feet as the governor, Stellos came out and said, oh, he said, oh, good, great governor. said, this man has been going all over the world, pestering people. He said, he, he never was called a pastor, but a pastor. He said, he'd been talking about Jesus Christ, been beat up on, whipped up on. You know, he'd been uh, stoned three, two or three times thought he was dead. And what are we going to do with him? And uh, Festus said, well, we can't, uh, we can't kill him because he's a Roman citizen. But he said, I'm going to give him a little while talk. But uh, that's about all we can do. So that's about what it is. Don't kill me. Just let me keep talking. <laughs> give me a few minutes here. Well, Katie, I enjoyed the praise and worship. You know, I like, I like the little Missouri dance that goes with it, too. You know when they get turned like that in Missouri? Well, I tell you what, you really blessed us. Amen. And it's really good. Yes. What a blessing. Well, you know, I appreciate all of you, and I'm honored to be the overseer. It's something that God has done. I'm honored that we have a captain, and I don't know how it is. I have to salute her because when I was in the Army, uh, I was just a specialist for it. That's what I was. And she told me last night, well, your real title now, according to the Army rule, is that you're a two-star general. I said, really? And the brother Bo Gomo, he's a general, Dr. Kim made him a general, a chaplain. But she told me that, uh, that it's an honorary two-star general. So I'm waiting for my uniform, so to wear my uniform. I want to wear it to the conference. I don't know. Do they, do they give the uniform also or do they hit the back? They don't give that. Is, is it honorary or real? Honorary. Okay. You, you well, have the clout. You tell them that they gave an honorary chaplaincy to an honorary fellow. How is that? <laughs> I don't know how they're going to respond to that. Well, glory to God. You have it this morning? 
Yeah. Well, I tell you what, you sound like I'm happy just to be alive. You know, I've been waiting for that undertaker to come to take me up, and I'm not waiting for the undertaker to take me down. I want to go up. Amen. We are the family of God, and Katie said last night. You know, she said I couldn't walk for thirty, wait for thirty seconds. Somebody come up, give me a kiss, he give me a big hug, and I said, yeah, maybe it's God's plan, perhaps, that we're so small because you know something. As James, John, and Peter were the inner circle, you today are the inner circle. We've had conferences where there were 400, 500 maximum, and you really didn't have the closeness that we've had here. So maybe it's been God's plan, though we may not know it, to have us a little bit smaller, a little bit more loving. You've got some people in the family that never participate in any festival that or anything that they have. I got a brother like that. He never comes to anything that we do. I never see him. He's in the family, but he's not really in the family. Right. He's a spectator from long distance, but not a participator. So, you know, those of you here today and throughout this conference are the real inner circle. That's why we have this closeness. That's why we have this unity. That's why we have this love among us. It's something that God put in us. You can't buy this in the five and ten cents story. It's something that came from above and not from below. And that's what we really need in the body of Christ. And I'm going to be talking about that today, that this is the missing link. What we have here, we have to somehow get it into all the churches. Everybody that's come here has felt loved, wanted, and needed, prayed for, and uh, sent off with a, a real blessing. I think that the scripture today is fitting for this occasion, 1 Corinthians 12, 26, from the NIV version. Uh, if one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. When you read that, even in the New, Interna in New International Version and also in the King James Version, it's not hard to say. You don't always get exactly the right meaning. But in the New Millennium, in-depth Bible, goes into a lot of detail, it has a little bit of a different way of saying it, and it goes like this, and it refers back to the other verses. God did this in a bracket, so that there should be no division or strife or schisms within the body of Christ. It's amen. amen. But that the members should work in harmony and mutually care for one another. Wow. It's amen. Wow, wow, wow. And that's what we're supposed to do. And we all are members of the body of Christ, but sometimes they're not really in the inner circle. They're not really in the family. The church in the Greek, all of you know this because you're, many of you are Bible scholars, some of you are great pastors, uh, evangelists, but even lay people know this. Ecclesia refers to the church. But it's not really a structure. It's a group of people who gather to worship God. Now, I've been in some churches where they gather to together to for social reasons. When I was in the Baptist church, we started at 11 o'clock sharp and finished at 12 o'clock no. <laughs> 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 and so I learned from the Baptist folk that when we have a church, I made a promise to our church, Jan and I, that we'd always let them out early. Not like some kind of courses that go on at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And the reason I would do that is so we we get more membership. And I said, I'll make your promise. I'll let you out at 10 to 12 every Sunday. They said, you got to be kidding. And they said, why? I said, so you can beat the Baptists to the cafeteria. <laughs> because they don't beat there first of all. I mean, travel clock sharp. The deacons in the back going, cut it off, cut it off. You know, this is it for the day. You might say, that's really quenching the spirit. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Ecclesia is the body of Christ. That's us. That's you, my friend. The body of Christ. And we have an obligation as leaders you know, to represent Christ in a special way. Amen. We are the called out ones to set apart. To do what? To carry the message to all the world. Amen. And we're doing that. I'm surprised that many of you don't really know. Some, some of you told me, hey, I can't believe all these things that AGA is doing. We see this little group here. It's like, well, why aren't they here? Well, they're scattered all over the world. We network with so many people. And I thank the Lord for that. Honor the word church. On the, it's found only twice, and it's in Matthew 16, 18, 
18, 17. It's not found in the other three Gospels, Mark, Luke, or John. When we think of the ecclesia, what do we think of? As I said earlier, most people think of it as a physical structure. But it's really the congregation of the Lord that's gathered to worship Him in spirit and in truth. It is a dedicated group of people who are supposed to be supposed to be loving, caring, tender-hearted, and who love each other so much that they give their life for each other. Amen. If you read the New Testament, you'll find out that's the way it was. Now, these disciples that you see, disciples, not apostles, some study Bibles wrongly say he ordained the 12 apostles. No, he didn't. He ordained 12 disciples. They were learners. They were never called apostles until we get beyond the day of Pentecost. It simply just means special messengers. Some people say they have all kind of words to describe an apostle. They are just a special messenger from God. Though today we see them as one who may be one set in their churches throughout all the earth. And that's okay. Early writers have seen the church in many ways. The disciples of Jesus, they almost in the beginning thought they were like a new sect or a new race or uh, something that might work along beside the Jews and the Greeks. They didn't quite understand what he was talking about most of the time. They were totally out of touch with what he was talking about. And the writers of the Hebrews saw the church as kind of the church of the firstborn, believers in general who make up the body. We believe that. Whoever wrote Hebrews, some people say Paul wrote it, others say we don't know. Martin Luther said, only God knows who wrote it. Doesn't matter we know it's inspired. James saw the church as a source of divine healing. Thank God for that. He talks about healing in his gospel, I mean, in his book. And John the Revelator talks about the different kinds of churches, the seven churches. And you know what? We can see a type of those today going on. You see all those different types that John talked about in the book of Revelation. I feel that this scripture is a... Uh, <coughs> I've got a little allergy problem, so that happens common often. I don't have any war here either. Uh, it happens frequently. So, <coughs> can you bring some more things? Uh, <coughs> you may have to scoot down and get that water out so often. I feel this is an appropriate scripture because of the time and hour in which we live today. People are turning away from the church in record numbers, dropping out of the race altogether. They're saying, why try? This can't do it. It's not worth it. The church has no power. Many of them are going after New Age religions. They're going into things that it's just hard. Satanic cults. They're going into things that are outside the family of God. And we are losing members at record numbers in this country. Somehow, someway, we have to attract more people to the church and keep them in the church. Some people are bored because they have just another Sunday boring service and they go home the same way they walked in the door. They're not growing spiritually. And you know, really, it's our fault as leaders. Amen. We can't blame the devil for everything. Right. And it's our fault. We have to do something to keep those people in the church. Now, in regards to the universal church, I'm sure that it came into existence, as you would agree today, on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2, when 120 devout, devout seekers were waiting for the descent of the Holy Spirit. Came in like a mighty rushing wind, a roaring some versions say roaring mighty wind came into the midst and set upon them as tongues of fire. We need the fire today. Come back. Amen. And they all began to speak in tongues as God gave them the others, the Holy Spirit. Yes. How many of you believe that salvation comes through the atoning blood of Christ? Amen. Paul said without shed blood there's no remission of sins. Now think about what you just said. I got you on the spot now. Now, do you believe this? A lot of people think of the disciples, and I'm convinced, and I believe this with all my heart and my years of study, and I know this to be a fact, and many of you know this too, but yet we never hear from the pulpit, that they were never saved according to the new covenant until after the day of Pentecost. They were given justification under the Old Testament Mosaic law. They were given right standing to stand before God each year. They had to keep sacrificing year after year after year. But it never was permanent. And some of the priests that were there 
involved in these sacrifices, they would die off and then have other priests. Hallelujah. But Jesus is the high priest for heaven. Amen. Once for all, he went into the temple. He did his job and it's finished. I love what Michael said. He didn't say, I am finished, but it is finished. Yeah. Yeah. That's really the case here. So we forget that. I want to today, I want to try to go back in ancient times and look at the personality of these disciples. And you see much of this today in the church. That they did things that were normally you would think that unsaved people would do. And they were not, in a sense, saved as we know it today. But they were justified, a forensic word used in the Old Testament. Now the King James wrongly uses that in the New Testament. Many of the versions today read, made righteous. We're made righteous by the blood of Christ. And we are in the righteousness of Christ. It's infused into us when we become believers in Christ. So we're not justified in the New Testament. We're made righteous. In the Old Testament, they were, they were justified. So they could stand before God because of all the sacrifices and following all the rules. Now, permit me to say this and to go into this to sign a passage of Scripture. You might say, when did they become really believers? When were they really saved? I said after Pentecost. I'm wrong about that. I'm going to show you when they were saved. John 20, 22. This is where a lot of people overlook this. To make it stronger, it says here that Jesus breathed on them and said, some of the expanded versions of the new millennium and others say, you must, bracket, you must receive the Holy Spirit in the Greek at once. The same thing he told Nicodemus. You must be born again. Now you may say, where are you headed with this story? Well, I'm headed here. The Spirit of Christ also is used several times in the book of Acts related, and the Spirit of Christ is, is the same as the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 9, Galatians 4, 6, Philippians 1, 19. Now, I have a note here from the New Millennium Bible that might be of interest to you. Now watch this. He breathed on them, you for sale. Now that doesn't mean anything but just a word. And it's expressed also in the Greek Septuagint in Genesis 2 7. In other words, when God breathed the breath of life into Adam, he became alive. He was dead. And began to breathe. The Hebrew word, and many of you know this word, ruah. So at this point, they had life given to them in John 20 22. They had no life. They were just learners. They were following Jesus and doing whatever he told them. They did some crazy things. You can see they had no idea what was going on here. So in Ezekiel 37 and 9, you have the same thing. Life is given to the dead bones. It's the same word. Here, verse 22, is the breath of Christ infuses divine life to living and dead men. This is what we have here. This impartation gave life, and it gave them Jesus' abiding presence to the apostle that would remain in them until the day of Pentecost when they were filled then completely with the Holy Spirit. Can you say amen? amen. The apostles were believers under the old covenant, not under the new covenant. They now experienced, at this point, spiritual rebirth by the Spirit, regeneration. John 3, 3, 7. The same thing that Jesus talked about when he spoke to Nicodemus. With the descent of the Holy Spirit, they were then energized on the day of Pentecost to go out and do the work. We need some more of that Pentecost of fire. Amen. Amen. We need it. And we hope to have more of that after this meeting, after this weekend. Now, set on this to lay a foundation that we must conclude that the disciples did not understand completely. And they seemed to be totally unaware of what Jesus was talking about. Time and time again, they never understood what he meant. They did not know the church was supposed to be what it was after Pentecost, a caring, loving, close knitted group of people who loved each other. Brother Michael said something last night was very significant. And you notice that he talked about all the people that walked by the man that had that was crippled from birth. But he said when Peter and John walked by, then there was a different situation. But I'll make your promise, brother, if they had walked by when they were disciples, they'd have done nothing for it. You see, they now were apostles. That makes a difference. You see, they were born again. Because you see, in the old, in the gospel books, they didn't have this concern. They argued, they fussed, they fought about everything. They were self-seeking. They wanted to say, I want to sit beside you. I want this, I want that. When you set up a kingdom, what can you do for me? Yes. Is that not selfishness? Yes. Self-seeking type spirit? Yes. Well, you don't see that in the 
book of Acts is thereafter. You see men who were willing to die for each other. They realized then what the family of God was all about. They did, had no concept of the family of God. They thought about their own families. I tell you, I read a book by Dr. R.C. Foster on the life of Christ. I didn't understand this. Jesus only traveled at certain times of the year. He didn't travel all the time. He traveled in the heat. He traveled in the cold. And he did certain things according to the weather conditions. We do that today. When you go out in the cold weather, you don't go to certain places. I don't go up north in the cold weather. I don't want to go to New York when there's three feet of snow. And I don't want to go to Miami because it's too hot. And so Jesus did the same thing. But they had to go back from time to time and fish and, 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 and take care of the family. But he was teaching them all the time. And they, they pack up again and take off. So we had this idea, oh, and when he said, come and follow me with this idea, he, oh, they stayed with him day and night and never saw the family for three and a half years. That's not the case. No good Jewish boy would ever desert his family, his wife, his father. Zebedee was left in the boat with him around like this when he was coming. It's like, hey, James, John, come go with me. And Zebedee goes, what's going on here? I'm sure he didn't sit there for three and a half years in the boat waiting for him to come back. <laughs> I'm just saying that a lot of people have to talk this thing through. And it took me a long time to figure it out, too. So in the new, uh, in the new people we see here in the book of Acts, we don't see all this arguing and fussing. In fact, we don't see any of that at all. This is what the church should be, the family of God. And I said all of that to talk about what we see today in these disciples and what you see today in the church. I want us to examine ourselves now. I've got quite a few points here, but I'm going to get them all in in time. Uh, I've got six points, but I'm just going to say a little bit about each one. And I hope that you're going to be like David. When Saul took that spirit and threw it at David, David ducked and said, Hey, I got the point. <laughs> so, I hope you get the point. I'm not going to throw a spear at you though. <laughs> Number one is this. First, there's a, a callous spirit. Oh, that's a hard one to deal with. Luke 9 and 12, 14. Late in the afternoon, the prayer came to him and said, Hey, send the crowd away so they can go to the surrounding villages and countryside and find food and lodging. And he goes on and on for lack of time. I'm not going to read it. You can see it. You see, their idea was this. We got quite a bit of money in this bag. And, uh, you know, they've been following us around now for several days. But essentially they were saying this. Why don't you let these people go out and fend for themselves? You know, we might need this money. We may have to dip into the bag from time to time. I haven't been fishing much lately. I need some money for my family. So let them go buy food for themselves. And we'll find a place to sleep. And, but there's not any place around here to eat. Let them go get their own place to sleep. Let them go get their own food. Is that really the kind of nature we see after the day of Pentecost? No, not at all. And they probably would have let their husband go without. Now, I don't know about John the Apostle. He called himself the beloved apostle. Jesus never really called him that. <laughs> he called himself that. But when the woman came in and washed Jesus' feet, all the other three gospels synoptics say, they all complain about the fact that the woman wasted all the fragrance. But in the book of John, he says only Judas complained. <laughs> he didn't like Judas at all. He might have seen, he said, he's always a thief. He's always stealing money. Well, he might not have been stealing money. He might have been giving some money to some of the other disciples to help them go back to feed the families. I don't know. If he was that bad, I don't know why Jesus trusted him with the money back. I really don't know. And he, he has some problems, no doubt. And he did try to take the money back. Some of the greatest scholars of Jehoiakim, Jeremiah, and uh, some of the ones that have written so many books, Messianic Jews, said that when he went back and took the 30 coins of silver, he tried to buy Jesus back. He kept waiting for Jesus to work a miracle at the, after they left the Garden of Gethsemane, but he never did it. He just kept waiting and waiting without hung himself. He's not going to do anything. And all the other disciples, they kind of thought he was going to do something too. Because it said that, that he quoted scripture when they found him in the garden of Gethsemane. All of a sudden, he just, they kept waiting him to do something. He, he just quoted the scripture. And after that, all the other, all the other ones fled. <laughs> they all took off. I mean, nothing happened. They had seen him feed the multitude. They'd seen him open blind eyes and heal people. And they were thinking, what's he going to do? There's 600 troopers out here now. they got bats, clubs. Change they're ready to kill him, and he just quotes the scripture and says, This is the will of God. So they didn't know what to do. This they, they didn't have any idea, even though he told them over and over they never understood what his mission was all about. In Luke 9, 12 and 17, 
Instead of believing that Jesus could feed a crowd this big for just a few hours, they said, send the multitude away. Essentially, that's kind of a selfish view. It's easy to get callous even being in the pulpit when you deal with problems every day. We forget that Jesus almost always, in every case, said Jesus looked at the crowds and what did he have? He had compassion. I don't believe the disciples necessarily had that kind of compassion. They were just there for teaching and learning. They missed an opportunity to speak with hurting people. You know, sometimes we like to be in the crowd, we like to be on the stage, we like to have people clap for us, we like recognition, but we never are available to talk to people one-on-one. -on -one. That's what makes us different. That's why many people are energized, have been energized this weekend. They left here energized. Almost every minister who contacts the headquarters always has a long story, and the first question they want to know is, how can I attract the crowd? You know, I don't want to know, can you use me? I'm a famous minister. I sat on the stage with Kevin Coleman. And uh, it doesn't make any difference to us. One call one day and said to Jan, said, do you have any famous people in your organization? Jan said, only one. And he said, who is that? Jan said, his name is Jesus. He said, uh oh, he said, I, I, I deserve that. <laughs> you know, only one. He's the only famous one we got. I want to tell you a true story. This is, the this is the true story. It's happened a few years ago. There was a guy that had been watching these two pastors on TV, and he really, he really enjoyed these pastors, and he wanted to go visit their churches. He goes to the first guy, and uh, he enjoyed the sermon. Afterwards, he asked the hammers or the bodyguards, hey, can I just have a moment to say hello to him? Just say hello. They said, no, I'm sorry, he's too busy. He's, he, he's got to leave quickly and going to the back door. He's got things to do. Call the next week and make an appointment, and maybe they'll let you speak with him. He said, okay, no problem. Of course, the next day, he, uh, I mean, next Sunday, he went to the other church. And uh, he uh, listened to the pastor. He really got excited, and he asked the hammer, say, can, uh, can I speak with the pastor? And he said, sure, you know, he'll take time to talk with you. In fact, uh, uh, probably he might even invite you to lunch. And they went over there and asked the pastor, would you like to invite this guy to lunch? He said, sure, tell him, tell him, tell him all, come on, we'll, we'll go eat together. So he was available. And that's eating lunch. They talked about a lot of things. He reached inside of his coat and he took out a check and he gave it to the pastor for four billion dollars. Wow. Wow. God works in mischievous ways. He has a sense of humor. I don't know how the other pastor felt once he heard about that story. He could have made another payment on his jet. This story teaches us something. We should always be approachable. Three A's. Approachable. Available, affirming to every person at all times. Ready for action. Ready to preach. Ready to talk with people at the moment. They need help now, not next week. Amen. If they come to you with problems, they want to talk to you, we have to do it. My wife says, we're too tired to talk to Katie. And, and she said, but we're going to do it. She said she had something really serious in her life last night. She had to talk to us. Only chance. It was only chance. After we talked a while, prayed a while, and cried a while, God is working. God's going to work it out, Katie. Come on, yeah. And you know what? We couldn't say, make an appointment next week. <laughs> I was waiting for that $4 million check to you. <laughs> After that, I, this, I, said, I, don't even, I don't even know what God's going to do. I know one thing, I was surprised to hear that their offering was over $5,000. Look at this. This small group gave $5,000. That's a miracle. I, I can't believe it. $5,000. That's, that's a lot of missionary money. God is so smart. He knows exactly what he's doing. You must have the personal touch. Unlike the disciples who were the handlers. They were handling Jesus. Like, move out of the way. Remember blind Bartholomew was yelling and screaming all the disciples in the front moving people out of the way. <laughs> he knew they only had one chance to get to him. He throws off his clothes and takes off. And uh, they try to hold him back. And this is kind of the way it is today. You know, uh, when you're a famous person or a great a prophet or a minister, everybody's trying to get to you. I saw a lot of people coming up to some of these prophets last night and being prayed for, but they took time to do it because we got a small crowd. Because that's why they're so loved by you, the leaders, because they take time for you. They're always available. Jesus was always touched with the feeding of our infirmities, the scripture says. 
He mixed and mingled with those who needed him at that moment. Only you, you today out here listening to my voice, you are the only people that can fulfill this mission. You're the only one. You do what people need you to do at that time. As the old adage says, and you've heard this before, it doesn't matter about your eloquence or your brilliance or your preaching skills or your ability to debate and to look very smart. No one cares how much you know until they know how much you care. Amen. Don't forget that. So how much do you care? Mm -hmm. I'm asking the wrong crowd. I know you care a lot. Number two is this. There is an impulsive spirit. Impulsive spirit. All of these six spirits we're talking about are talking about the inner nature, the persona, the real person that's on the inside. And all of these are found in uh, chapters 8 and 9 of Luke. On the Mount of Transfiguration, the Bible says, Peter, not knowing what he would say, and he was known for that, right? He was very impulsive. He never knew what he would say. He would just jump up and say anything. I don't see the real wisdom in this man, but look at him next to the day of Pentecost. Oh, you're looking at a man that had wisdom that was unfathomable. Yeah. A man that was looked up to thousands of people. Even, even his shadow, that people would try to get into his shadow to be healed. Unbelievable. He wasn't able to do that before that time. He wasn't sent. Peter, not knowing what he's saying, and you can see it up there, he says, the Master, it's good for us to be here. Let's put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He didn't know what he was saying. <laughs> you see, he thought Jesus was just a prophet, even though he was told different. Elijah here is the, is the prophet. Moses is the lawgiver. These are the two most revered people in the eyes of Jewish people during that time. They were very highly revered. But they were not quite sure what Jesus was. Kept talking about in strange terms about setting up this kingdom. They kept pushing. Well, when are you going to set it up? Want, I want to get over here. I want to be on this side. When are you going to set it up? Well, he would always talk about how it was going to be done, but they never could connect to what he was talking about. But they really were concerned about where am I going to be? What position will I have in the kingdom of God? I mean, read it for yourself. Just read it right there. It's on every page. So we're dealing with some very immature young men. And there's a lot of immature people in the church today. You see, this could have been the, the Feast of Booths during this period, you don't really know. But what you're looking at here is, it says that they, there, was, there was glory there. There was some glorious feeding about Elijah and Moses. But when they looked at Jesus, they began to glow as he looked in his, his pre-incarnate state. Just, it, just like rays of light, white glitzing. They couldn't even look at him and they fell down. That's the way he's going to look at heaven. I'm going to tell you something. He's not going to be red or yellow, black and white, but he's going to be that precious one in our sight. We're going to look like a man. He can't, he's got to look like everybody. Now, I don't know what I'm going to do with that old hymn. They want to change the name of the Washington Redskins. They've been fussing about that. So what am I going to do about the hymn now? Jesus loves the little children of the world, red and yellow, black and white. They're precious in his sight. I guess he just loves on the black, white, and the, and the Asians. I don't know. Maybe he just loves, we're going to have to leave most of the red, I guess. And pretty soon they're going to be able to change that. I don't know. Anyway, we, we have too much offense in our country today. Everything is so politically correct. Some of the words I've heard in the past are not good words. And it may be offensive to red skins, but a lot of people are not offended by it. So how did I get into that? I just want you to know that, uh, be careful what you say. I'm talking to myself as well. Peter was always saying things he shouldn't be saying, very impulsively. And as I've gotten older, I'm more careful about what I say. This is important. When I was young, I'd say anything. Didn't really matter. If you didn't like it, fine. Didn't, didn't bother me. He said, it's good for us to be here. Let's make three times an hour. But that voice from heaven changed his mind. He said, he essentially said, this man here, what you're looking at, he's not just one of the other two. This is my beloved son, Listen to him. Hear him. That's what he said. Here we see an impulsive spirit, impulsive nature in Peter. But once he heard that, this had an impact on Peter. Peter mentions this in his writing. So we know that Peter did write First and Second Peter. He talks about that experience again. And in the first chapter of John, the Gospel of John, when John says, we have seen his glory. What is John talking about? I'll tell you. He's talking about the Mount 
of transfiguration. We have seen his glory. He, Peter, James, and John saw his glory on the Mount of Transfiguration. We all want to have the answers when people ask us questions. But I'm thinking that as leaders and as those who are supposed to have wisdom, it may be better to say, you know, it would be nice talking about that, but I don't have all the answers. I think we'll get more respect out of other people, bishops and leaders, if we just say, I'm not sure about the answer, but I'll pray about it. I'll do some research, and I will get back with you. Don't forget to get back. Because a lot of preachers never get back with me. When they say, I start showing them all these scars on my hand where we got them in a car crash in India and all this stuff. And they said, Brother, I said, come on, go with me. They go, I've always wanted to go, but Brother, let me, let me just pray about that. I'll get back with you. You know what? In 25 years, I've never had one to call me back. Amen. And I said to one recently, I, I've asked him several times. He said, I, I'll get back with you, Brother. Let me pray about it. I'll get back with you. I said, Brother, Revelation says it won't be in the lion's now. <laughs> I finally just told him straight out. He done told me that three times. He said, yeah, you're right about that. So preachers are known to lie also. Hallelujah. She you love me? Okay. You know, we're in an age of information overload. Overload. And that's why some people say my sermons are really annoying and not annoying. Because I get with an overload. They can't help it. It doesn't come out with too much information. But the experts in communication say this. Listen to this. The average person today is bombarded with 35,000 messages a day through emails, text messages, billboards, television, radio, Twitter, Facebook, blogs, and all kinds of modes of communication. Wow, can you believe that? And I, I stay away from all that stuff. I let my beautiful wife take care of that. So she's probably dealing with about 50,000 of these a day. She said, you just don't understand. I said, I don't want to understand. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'm not very caring, but... <laughs> but I'm saying, I, I don't want anything to do with that. I'm from the old school. Just give me a telephone and I'll just talk on the phone. Can you believe that? I mean, that 35,000 things coming through. Yeah. That's probably why we've got a small group here, not 500. They probably aren't watching, uh, watching the Twitter or playing with their computer. <laughs> so four guys coming to the restaurant recently, they all sat down in, in Cracker Barrel, and they just came and they looked to be about 30 years old. They all sat down. I just watched them, and they all had these little, yeah. little hand phones. And they never said a word. And they sat there for 30 minutes to build it until they got their food. And they never said a word to each other. I'm thinking, what a terrible society. We can communicate through machines. Machines communicate to people. Yes. We have no personal touch anymore. Mm -hmm. Come on. I'm convinced that the Lord has the answer for us. And that is, stay away from Twitter. <laughs> yes. I don't know why I said that. I'm just kidding. <laughs> and number three is this. Number three, there's a, there's a fearful spirit. There's nothing any worse than a fearful spirit. Yes. <laughs> now, I must confess that sometimes the fearful spirit comes on me too. <laughs> now, if you tell me you ever get fearful, I know you're lying. Remember, it won't be the liars in heaven. Yeah. <laughs> so, Brother Jesse told me I was not a fearless leader, but I was sometimes a fearful leader. <laughs> so I had to get behind him. And uh, he told me, uh, get behind me, Harbuck. That sounded familiar, get behind me, Harbuck. <laughs> <laughs> He didn't say the other word. They didn't say Satan. He said, get behind me, on it. I said, okay, I'm going to hide behind you. I don't want to see those terrorists come out of these woods here down in Mexico. That would kill about 25,000 people. But later on, though, I kept saying, brother, I'm concerned about you going over there all the time. Oh, I'm okay, I'm okay. But the last time he went, there was three people killed in front of the church. He came back and said, I'm not okay. <laughs> you know what? He said, I think the Lord is telling me not to go back. I said, that's what he told me before. <laughs> You know, when we're scared to do something, we say, the Lord told me. You know, we preachers always say, you know, the Lord told me to do that. <laughs> you know, we have a real advantage. It's very spiritual to say, the Lord told me. The Lord told me not to go. I, that ministry is closed now. The Lord told me not to go back. <laughs> and that way, we come out looking real good, brothers. You know, we never have to uh, be too ashamed. <laughs> The disciples came to Jesus here in Luke 8, 24 and said, Master, Master, we're going to die. Greek says we are going to die. The meat says we are perishing here in the, in the middle. But they're not perishing. They are about to perish because the water is coming into the boat. It says here that Jesus got into the boat with the disciples. He said, let's cross over to the other side of the Lake of Galilee. They launched out. And uh, the Lake of Galilee is known to have a lot of storms. They come up very quickly just like that. And they've sunk a lot of ships. But as they sailed, Jesus slept 
on a Christmas mat back there and he put a pill on his head and he was sound asleep. When he came up, they were in jeopardy. They were terrified. And they woke Jesus up saying, Master, Rabbi, we're going to perish. What are we going to do? Jesus got up and rebuked the wind, the raging water, and said to them, Where is your faith? He was trying to teach these guys something. Amen. They've never caught on to it. Where is your faith? You know what? That's a good question for us. When we get fearful, when we get scared, you've heard this all through the conference. Where is our faith? And I'm not rebuking anybody. And you can't always, if you have to be practicing faith every day, when you get in a situation like this, you're not going to have it. If you haven't been talking to God and you're not energized by faith every day, and you haven't, you haven't had trials and tribulations where you walk through them time and time again, I promise you, when you get into a trial and a storm, you're going to have problems. You're not going to have faith at that time. I can assure you that. Where is your faith, he said. And they were afraid of what had happened when they saw his great power and they marveled. And he, after he rebuked the winds, they said, who is this? Who can this be? Well, they've been with him for a long time. Now they ask, who can he be? I mean, he's, telling them, he's been telling them who he was. And they go, and the scripture says, who can this be? And the storm stopped. Who can this be? For he even commands the wind and the water, and they obey him. Now, they had to be smart enough to know that he wasn't just a man. He was the God man. Because no human being could say, okay, now, calm down now, ocean. Calm down. Stop all that glory. Just calm down. Let peace prevail here. And everything just stops. I don't know if any man can do that. Unless it's Jesus. Observe what's happening in this story. They have a fearful spirit. Fearful nature. I think probably most of them were quite cowardly. Uh, at least John, though, was near the cross with the women. All the rest of them took off. And uh, they fled. I mean, without, I say fled. I mean, the scripture says they left. I mean, they took off. There was nobody there but the women. Thank God for women. They're always faithful. Paul learned also later in his life. Yeah, he learned later on that he had about 25 women working with him. He learned to trust women. They're very important. One time we had a guy that uh, came in to be ordained. and uh, He came up to be ordained and one of the, one of the elders in our fellowship said, now, who called you God and your mother? He just kept standing there. He's only about 21 years old. He just kept looking. He said, I said, who, who called you God or your mother? And he, got, he couldn't say anything. And the guy just got up, the elder got up and just put his hand on the head and the guy fell straight back. And you know what? He prayed over him for about five minutes and the guy left and we never saw him since. <laughs> I, guess, I guess his mother called him. But what I'm trying to say is Jesus told him to get into the boat. It wasn't their mothers and it wasn't their idea. Jesus told them, they, he called them and he told them that he would take care of them, but they still didn't believe it. Number four says, there's an undiscerning spirit. NASB now, they read a little differently from the King James here. Peter said, Master, these crowds are pressing in on you, and you ask them who's touched you. King James says she spent all the money on physicians. The other version just say she spent all of the money. So I don't know which is correct here, whether it was doctors. We don't want to run the doctors down, but King James says she spent all the money on physicians. He says, what do you mean? He uh, said, what are you, what, is, what are you saying? Who touched me? You got all these people pushing you. Let me just tell you something. Jesus knew the difference in a touch of faith. He just kept by to touch it. All these thousands of people were touching Jesus, but there was one touch that was different. He said, I felt healing power or energy come out of me. Now, Jesus, the only time I can think of him asking questions like this, I guess he's working out his humanity, or maybe he's teaching them something. He said, he touched me. Being God, he ought to know who touched him. And he had went out to the grave of Lazarus and said, where have you laid? Well, he already knew that. He already knew. Well, the reason why Jesus has tears in his eyes is not because Lazarus is dead. It doesn't make any sense, logically. For him to have tears in his eyes because he knows he's going to raise him from the dead. Why would he be crying at the tomb? People say, Oh, he just cried because he loves Lazarus. No, it's not true. I tell you why he's crying. Because they sent for him the day before and they kept saying, What am I going to admit him? Master, if you'd have been here, he wouldn't have died. Mary was, she didn't even come out. She's sitting in there still mourning. And later she jumps up and walks along beside, beside him to the tomb and says, Hey, Master, if you'd have been here, he wouldn't have died. You know why he's weeping? We don't know much about Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Some people say they were rich. They may not have ever seen the miracles he did. They heard about it. Because Lazarus had been sick a long time until these girls took care of him. But I'll tell you what, they were mad at him. He stayed out there a lot at that day. 
because they were mad. And I think he was hurt because they didn't trust him. That's why you have the tears. You, know, you, you see it, you see it on every, in every, every situation here. Undiscerning spirit. Jesus knows the difference. He said, man, be of good cheer. Your faith has made you whole. She would have trusted him, the fridge on his garment. And you know, then he said, Shalom, go in peace and be kind of Be healthy and spiritually prosperous. That's what he said in, in the original Shalom. Now we ask the question, what's going on? It's an undiscerning spirit. Understand Jesus, understand this, that there's a type here in this dress, I mean, in this robe. That this is the last thing that the hymn maker does, she <coughs> throws up the hymn. As Jesus finished his work on the cross, he finished the healing for this woman. King James says she was made ever with whole, meaning that she was healed. Look, you've got to have psychological problems if you've been with that problem, that bleeding problem for 12 years. Physically, mentally, and spiritually, she was drained completely out. For her mind, body, and spirit was healed completely. He touched the whole person, and she went on her way. He said, Shalom. Remember this, Jesus is Jehovah, the Yahweh, Rapha. He is the great I am. Amen. The same back that bore the cross of God, Martha's heel, is the same one that took your sins and forgave you and forgave me. Amen. Isaiah 51, by his stripes we're healed. Yahweh, Rapha. Number five is this, a self-seeking spirit. And the Bible then says, the dispute among the disciples came up about Who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of God? Always a big debate about that. Now, there's always problems in churches because everybody's debating about what position they can have to make them look good. They want to get the highest position. Most of the deacons I've seen that ran for deaconship ended up being the meanest folks in the church because they want the deacon to get in and beat up the pastor. Uh-oh, I'm in trouble now. And if you worked in churches as long as I have, you've seen that. Brother Henderson, you've seen this, right? I've heard screaming and hollering and yelling in two or three churches I worked in. Sunday, I mean, on Sunday afternoon we have men's fellowship and all that. Screaming and hollering, digging, yelling and hollering. You know something? I'm proud to tell you this. Among the leaders of this fellowship, and you can believe this or not, talking to those who are not called up with the dollars, we've never had an unkind word in 27 years. In I'm telling you that Christ is in this group. The, the presence of God is with us. And I, I seriously doubt What's going on in churches like that where the deacons are yelling and screaming and have no concept of what the scripture is all about? I'll never be convinced, if you're not tempted hearted, I'll never be convinced that a mean spirited, spiteful Christian who claims to be Christian is going to be going to heaven. That's what I'm a fruit inspector. And I don't believe in eternal security. If you're a mean spirited, hateful, backbiting, mean, I, I just can't believe that you're going to visit home in heaven. And number six, and lastly, a judgmental spirit. Wow. I, I've been judgmental sometimes, but I ask the Lord to forgive me. Yeah. Now, in uh, Matthew 71, Jesus isn't talking about just the kind of judgment or evaluation that I'm thinking of. He's speaking a lot there, probably to the Pharisees because they're in the crowd, because they were going to secretly meet as they did with him and have him crucified. They had meeting after meeting after meeting. They met together and they had secret meetings. He's talking about beating people, whipping people in the synagogue. The credo there means having a secret meeting. Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 is this. The spiritual man, the spiritual person, evaluates or judges all things. Is that a contradiction? Huh? Not really. God's given us gifts, so we are protected when somebody intends to hurt us. God was saying, Watch out for that person. The Holy Spirit says, hey, watch out for something in that person. And every time I've heard that voice of the Holy Spirit, I realize it's God talking, and sure enough, that person turned out to be a troublemaker. I believe in a way that women, women, are a little more sensitive to men in, in allowing the Spirit to speak to them. That's right. And also, there's a danger on the other side. Women are a little more sensitive to all spirits. Every time you see the woman with the crystal ball, you see all these people involved in witchcraft, they use the women. Because they're sensitive to all spirits. But they are more sensitive to the Holy Spirit as well. And I thank God for that. You just got to know the difference in the spirits. Yeah. The Holy Spirit is going to guide us and be our helper. But the other spirits are going to put you in bondage. Amen. That's the situation. A self seeking spirit. As long as your motives are pure, the Lord will look out for you. 
Now, on this occasion, Jesus brought up a child. That's why we're called the little children. Jesus loves the little children of the world. I don't know if he literally that hymn probably meant children. I don't really know because the Hebrew children were grown people. They were led out of Egypt. They called the Hebrew children. Red and yellow, black and white, they're precious in his life. A child is teachable. Amen. Are you teachable today? They want to learn things. A child is trusting. Whatever you promise a child, you've got to give them. They never forget it. Am I right about that? They, they remember what you tell them. Yeah. And a child is a, a child is a, is tender heart. I think I said that. When the Holy Spirit is in your life, you should be tenderhearted towards other people. Now, I want to uh, say a little bit about number six here at this last point. Jesus here, in point number six, the judgment of the Spirit, he's in Samaria. Now, Samaria had been captured by the Assyrians and some of them taken to Babylonia. And on, he's in Samaria, but he's trying to go back to Jerusalem. Now, some of the best authorities believe this. This happened probably, he sent some of them ahead to secure a place for lodging. So they probably went ahead and they had a place that they were going to stay because it was snowing, according to R.C. Foster. The weather's cold. And they said they told him and they didn't like him because he was headed towards Jerusalem. Well, that doesn't exactly tell us the problem. But some of the research into this, some of the researchers that are quite brilliant men and women that research this, say this, that what happened here he had sent some of them ahead to secure a place to stay because the weather was turning cold. They were trying to get to Jerusalem. But when he showed up, he might have sent James and John and Peter ahead to secure, secure the room. They had money. And they said, it's fine, no problem. But when he showed up, and then the innkeeper looked at him and said, uh-oh, he's a Jewish rabbi. He's got on the road. He said, you're not staying here. James and John said, hey, Lord, you know, you want us to call down the fire like the ancient prophet? We'll call down the fire on you. They were carried away with the authority here. Now, the Lord said, no, I don't want you to do that. Uh, you don't have to call down the fire. Because that's not the nature of Jesus. To just kill people because they disagree with you and don't like them. And I think he was teaching them something here. Jesus rebuked them. He said, you don't even understand the kind of spirit you got. You got the wrong spirit here. The lesson that he learned is this too. Uh, a lot of people who go out, I see a lot of strict preachers, and they, they normally are yelling and screaming. You're one, I'm not talking about you. And they're telling tell everybody, you're going to hell. You know, you know you, everybody's going to hell. You know, it's not what you say, it's how you say what you say. You see, there's a lesson that we've learned here. You can be sincere, like these guys, but too severe. You, you can be sincere in what you want to say, but you can be severe. Especially when you're talking to non believers You know, we always say God is moving. They said on the, this morning, God is moving in Africa. I thought it said God is moving to Africa. I didn't know, but we say God is moving. Where is he moving to? When you're talking to a non-believer, they don't know what you're talking about to say God's moving. They're going to say, where is he going? I thought he was in heaven. <laughs> when you mix and mingle with only those you share your views with, this is the way you talk. This is called Christianese language. You heard of Vietnamese language? This is Christianese. Christianese language. You may communicate with others outside of your family. You know, and if you do this, you will get rid of some of those words. Let me make this clear. I learned that statement from President Obama. He always says, let me make this clear. I like that statement. So I just speak to that future. Never has it been more important than right now for people to hear the truth about the Word of God. Yes. This country is in bad condition. Right. Well, they need to hear the truth without waiting. Some people are losing their jobs because they've spoken up. You may have the right doctrine, but the wrong spirit. You will drive more people away from Christ than you'll draw to Christ. We should be loving our neighbors, I said. Amen. Your neighbor might be a white beater, drunkard, no. homosexual, no. somebody you don't like. But still, we have to love them. We may not like them, but we have to love them. Our job as a minister is to be a witness ourselves. A lot of ministers don't ever witness except in the pulpit. We never take time to just say a word of encouragement to people outside in their convenience store. Be an example. You don't have to really defend Jesus. Just, you don't have to sell it. Just introduce people to it. Tell it who you really is. That'll make a big difference. Psalms 38, 8 says this, Taste and see that the Lord is good. And you say amen. Hallelujah. Remember these points. Callous spirit, number one. Number two, the impulsive spirit. Number three, a fearful spirit. Four, undeserving spirit. Five, self-seeking spirit. Six, judgmental spirit. Hallelujah to God. Thank you, Lord.
Father, we thank the Lord for the Word of God that gives us strength. I thank you for the fact, God, that we challenge ourselves to be all that we can be for the sake of the gospel. Let us, not let, let us be moved in our spirit to do great and mighty things than ever before. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.